murders took place in an AME church. Most people would not know what kind of church that was at all. You know, AME, you know, what is that? Particularly outside of the South. Uh, and, 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 and we have we've been told by people that uh, the book has been marketed in the Providence, Rhode Island airport, for example. Someone was in D.C. just the other day and the book was in the D.C. Uh, uh, airport. And so so uh, we knew that if this were to reach a national audience, there would be many people who just wouldn't know. AME, African, Methodist, Episcopal, well, what is it? Is it Methodist? Is it Episcopal? You know, what the heck is it? So we knew we needed to talk about uh, the history of the denomination, why it came about, and what's important about it, and how it intersected with the unfolding of American history and crucial themes and issues in, in Southern history. And beyond that, uh, we wanted to talk about the history of Emmanuel and how the Emmanuel story tied in to the, the larger story of African Methodism and how it developed and the crucial role that, that it played and the, and the ministers and the early founders played. And so uh, that's, why, that's why we have some significant doses of, uh, of history. But uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that I was faced with, particularly in doing the history for this kind of book, was trying to uh, meld the past with the present, and we do that frequently throughout the book, and we thought, we thought that that would be uh, an important kind of literary device to, to use because it would keep the story flowing and kind of alive and give some important juxtapositions, uh, past and present together. But that was a challenge. It was a challenge to, to do that, to find a point at which you could link the two together without the construction seeming to be artificial and, uh, and forced, so to speak. So that was, that was one of the challenges. And, and just, to, uh, just to bring uh, my remarks to a close, we have looked at the, the arc of Mother Emmanuel from the beginning to the present, and we have laid out a story which uh, is structured around the various challenges that the congregation has faced historically from the very beginning all the way to the present. Uh, the, the challenge of its birth in 1818 in the midst of a slaveholding society and what that, and what that meant, and then the challenge of resurrection after its antebellum destruction and the challenge of resurrection after the war, uh, and then the challenge of, of nature, uh, the, the earthquake, and so on. And now, uh, the most recent challenge wrought by the hand of, of a man and a society, a man who was a product of a certain kind of society, and where we are today. And it's an ongoing story, uh, and, and, and the thing about this is, I mean, it's, and Herb is used to this as a journalist, particularly, but uh, unlike most of the research that we do as historians, you know, the story has some, uh, has a definite beginning, definite end point, but this is, this is a story that as we wrote it, it continued to evolve. So, so, so for example, you know, uh, uh, toward the end, we find out that uh, one of the changes at the church is now Emmanuel is going to get its first female pastor for the first time in its history. And we were able to add that right at, right at the end of the story. So it continued to evolve even, even as we did our best to capture the essence of it. And even that's changed. Yeah, and even now that's changed. another minister. Yeah, that's changed. Yeah. changed. So, yeah. so we've got this continuous movement. So, so, so uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just end my remarks at that. Well, the other thing that, that usually he says um, is that, you know, everybody wanted to do something to, to help, you know, and I think we felt collectively this is what we could do. And that we were here, from here, had this knowledge, and that we could come together and tell the story. So that's why, you know, in the first couple of chapters in particular, 
you know, we try to write about, we write about the weather, and we give you, we try to explain, you know, where, for example, the Marriott and the, um, the Embassy Suites, which, where the Citra was, um, where they are in relation to the church, and where the sea is, and where, you know, I'm sorry, uh, because if you've never been here, or even if you have been here, you don't necessarily get the lay of the land, um, and just the texture um, and immediacy, and, and, and certainly we were able to, to do that, um, and, and knowing these people, um, and felt like, well, we could do it, and not someone coming in who doesn't, doesn't know the town, and, um, so we really, we started, we started in the summer, and we had to hand in the first draft to, before Christmas. So it was a pretty fast turnaround, and, um, you know, uh, we did, like we said, you know, we did the best we could in a short yeah. period of time. Well, well, but if, if the, if it hadn't been three of us. Couldn't have done it. We couldn't, we couldn't have done it. You know. it, it, it just would have been yeah. impossible. And even if it if if it were two of us, but, yeah, we 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 still be working on it. But it would be, would be it would be different. Yeah. If it, you know, if it was only two of us, it would be different. It would be a different book. Because I always think about life experiences prepare you. I think prepare you for the moment or the challenge that you're yeah. faced with. An example of that is many years ago, Reverend Glover was in close to the end of his life. And I knew his daughters, because I remembered them from my childhood in the church. And I called, and I said, I want to come up and see your father. So I went up uh, about 10 years ago, um, you know, maybe eight years ago, and I sat with him. He was living in Columbia at the time. He later became, after he left Emmanuel in 19, I think it's 55. Um, he let, he, no, I'm sorry, not, not 65, 65. It was the year right after my family left. Charleston. He became president of Allen University in 1965. Yeah. And he stayed there a number of years. He left and he came back. I think he had two terms as, as Allen's president. And Allen, for me, is very important within the AME denomination right. because it's an AME uh, school, right. if you don't know where it's in Columbia. And it's one of about eight or nine, maybe ten across the United States. And my grandmother, who raised me, was a member of Emmanuel, and she she used to say, when you go to college, you're going to Al. <laughs> you know, right. when? And that was drummed into my yeah. head. It was a very important and a very prestigious school because it trained, it trained ministers, it trained teachers, uh, and, and, and a lot of professionals. So going back to Reverend Glover, I was sitting in this den in a chair pretty much like this. And it was a box under the chair, and I was looking at this box. I saw that there were some tapes, real, real tapes. The journalist. I said, what are these things? And, he, and, and make a long story short, because they're all long stories. He said, these are some of my sermons, some of the speeches. And so I was able to take those tapes. And your professor here, he helped me. In fact, we got, he had an old real to real tape recorder. And we, and we the only one in Charleston. Yeah, the only one in Charleston. <laughs> And we were able to transfer those tapes into digital cassettes that I could use uh, for later use. And I didn't know for later what that later use was going to be. But many, one of them was a 1959 address that Reverend Glover gave on John's Island at Esau at the Progressive Club that was run by Esau Jenkins. And wow, when I heard that, I heard not only Reverend Glover's voice, but I heard Esau Jenkins' voice on that tape. And it was like an hour, almost two hour program. And I couldn't have used all of it, but I used part of that, and that's what you read in the book. That came from those tapes that were sitting under that chair when I went to meet Reverend Glover. And I was able to use that, and he was talking, this was 1959, and this was one on the threshold of the civil rights movement in Charleston. This was on the threshold of that period of time that when I was 13 years old, in 1963, I didn't know of Emmanuel's role in organizing students, young students, high school kids from Burke to stage sit-ins and demonstrations outside of the 
Walgreens, not the Walgreens, I'm saying Crest. Yeah, Crest. Yes. Yeah, Crest, Walgreens. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they had Walgreens. They didn't have Walgreens. Maybe not here in Charleston. Not here in Charleston. But you know what I mean. Yeah. They were like the foot soldiers, the right. early foot soldiers in the Civil Rights Movement. Now, I was 13 years old. I didn't know until many years later, after I left Charleston, left Charleston, that that was going on. Either I, either, first of all, the Post and Courier, which I used to deliver the Evening Post and then the new, then News and Courier, they didn't cover that stuff. So it wasn't on television, it wasn't in the newspaper, my grandmother didn't talk about it, my father didn't talk about it, and I was so young that I was oblivious to it all. So there are many kinds of things like that in addition to, and I'll close with this, in addition to, now we knew of John C. Calhoun. Everybody black in Charleston knew of his significance. And, and in the book, you probably read that uh, Leon Austin, he used to, he and some of his friends, they would try to throw, they would throw rocks right. trying to hit the statue. They could never do it. But in trying to hit the statue with the rocks, at least it improved their baseball arm, you know. And I didn't know, I didn't know then that the Citadel, the role that the Citadel played in this history, this resurrection, this crushing of the church and the, and, and the race relations in the city. I didn't know, of course, like I said, Denmark Vesey. And one thing I did not know, and, and, and I wish I'd known it then, the placement of the International African American Museum is on Concord Street, which is uh, where the projects, Ansonboro Projects, is right across the street from Concord Street. And that's where I spent the first 14 years of my life. And I didn't know of Gadsden's Wharf. You didn't even know that history. I didn't even know that history. And as a journalist, I've been blessed that I've been to West Africa and written about that connection between Low Country, South Carolina, and West Africa, and Sierra Leone in particular. But I didn't know that history. You know, and it's so tragic in the sense that not only did adults not speak to you about what was going on in the immediate, in your immediate neighborhood. But nobody knew that history then. You know, we weren't taught our history, and that's it was a missed opportunity to really understand. I think, as a younger person, as as a, as a teenager, maybe, to understand what I was living through at the time. You know, it wasn't until, like I said, I left Charleston and studied it in college, and later on, uh, as a journalist, started writing about these things, that all of these things became, you know, and then of course Lawrence Street. Lawrence, because the housing project, the, the southern border of the housing project was Lawrence Street. We knew Lawrence Street. And we, we, you know, you knew it, but you didn't know who it was who named was. for. Who was right. Henry Lawrence. Henry Lawrence. Lawrence. You know, so. When all those streets, like Mary and Elizabeth and Alexander Street, those are all named for his kids. Mm -hmm. You know, John, made all those streets there, you know, because that's really the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so you, we, and then also the other thing, we, we in the book, as you notice, we, as you saw, you read it, we, we wanted to give voice to those who lost their lives. And we say that this is a book that we wished that we didn't have to write. But of course, in it, we wanted to weave their stories in into this narrative, particularly because <coughs> they were people, as Bernie has said so eloquently in other presentations we, we've done, that they were people of faith. They were there longer, they stayed longer to have and an, 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 to improve their relationship with God, you know, uh, and each of them played a critical role not only in the church and not only in their families but their communities and it is that sort of um, uh, spirit of the AME church that you have uh, an obligation to the church but you also have an obligation to society. And of course, you know, the Reverend Pinckney is the best example, perhaps, of that, as a legislator and as a minister. What? Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, I think we probably want to throw yeah. open yeah. questions, yeah. Uh, comments. Am so. I allowed to ask a question? He's going to kill me. As long as, long as, long as, long as, long as it's a nice question. <laughs> yes. It's a hard question. Well, I heard about listening to you and thinking, I don't know today that students are taught uh -huh. the history that you're talking about more than slavery occurred um, in the detail, yeah. the level at which you're describing, and it's to me a tragedy. Yes. But yeah. how how do we change that? I mean, 
we just saw another murder of a black man by a police officer. How, mm -hmm. Bernie, you talked about the environment. How do we lift up what happened in a manual to actually have real conversations that can, can start to change the environment? Well, it, it, it's interesting you say that. I mean, one of the things um, the, um, is that you have to understand the history about the attitudes mm -hmm. that would, would create a situation that would have been right to happen. Um, and people don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, you can't understand it without the history. Well, you know? well, well your question is great. I, I think about um, as, as young people then, as young people now, I think that I remember distinctively, uh, and this, I, you probably, Bernie, you remember that there was a woman in the Charleston Museum and who headed the Charleston Museum in the Laura 50s. Laura Bragg. Yeah. Laura Bragg. I think she was responsible for desegregating the Charleston Museum. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I remember, I have vivid memories of Prof. Dr. Uh, Walter Brown, mm -hmm. who was my sixth grade math teacher. And we've talked about this in, in, in part of this, but I didn't put it in the book. That, well, I think I did mention the Charleston Museum. He would walk us down King Calhoun Street to the Charleston Museum. And I remember vividly seeing that that place was a real spooky, dusty, old, dark place. But the ones, and the, there are many striking things, but the thing that you will see in the new museum was that whale, the whale bone okay. in the lobby. That was over the lobby, even in the old museum. The point I'm trying to make is I think if you, if you somehow use the technology today in communities around the country and blend the technology, use the technology to talk about history in an interactive way, that this street has an, is named this because of this. Mm -hmm. This building used to be this. For instance, the rice, muse, the rice facade, the facade of the rice building over by the port terminal. I didn't, you know, if I knew what rice meant to the southern economy, yeah. it would give you so much information. I mean, it just opens your world up. Well, so slaves were Do you find the that historians, well, not even historians, because I know true historians know this, but that